through your design, there are so many different facets. There's commercial, residential, new builds, renovations, and everything in between. We have an amazing designer here with us today. Welcome, Tamara. Hi, Amy. It's so great to have you on the show. I think that a lot of local people, any of the projects that we mentioned today, they would be like, oh, right, I frequent there all the time. That's my favorite restaurant. That's my favorite spa. And they don't necessarily realize all the work that goes into those places. It's so nice to actually be working more in my own backyard because most of my career I've spent working on projects in big cities or internationally, lots of airports, you know, hotels around mm -hmm. the world. So I love when people come up to me and say, you did bin four, we go there all the time. That's our favorite burger place. And please bring one to our city. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's so great to have that kind of feedback. And I think too, when people are thinking interior design, a lot of times they don't think of the commercial side of it and how big that is. They just mm -hmm. think of, you know, the residential decor, that kind of the, mm -hmm. I don't want to say fluffy stuff, but like the soft yeah. finishes and all of that. Mm -hmm. But really in commercial design, you have to appease everybody, get a brand in and put so much thought into it. Commercial design is a bit of a different animal, which is part of my obsession with it. I still, I do do bits of residential and have over the years. Um, but my love for commercial design is that every single project is different. So if you're doing a retail space, the needs and what you're trying to do in that space and what you're trying to create and the purpose of what you're trying to do is very different than a hospitality space or a restaurant or a spa. So mm -hmm. the challenges and the breadth of knowledge that we're required to have to be able to fit out these spaces and actually create viable businesses, because when it comes right down to it, it's creating guest experiences and how right. people use the space. But it's a bottom line. It's also a business. So how can we drive sales? How can mm -hmm. we create a brand that's going to be rolled out in different locations? How can we make this experience successful? I'm making it all unique too, because you don't want every single spa cafe to have all the same elements and such as well. That is a real challenge. People ask me that all the time. How do you come up with the ideas? How do you keep it fresh? How do you create something different? But that is, that is my main passion in design is what can we do? You know, what, what can we bring onto this project that's fresh, that's a new idea? And in a world where it is so oversaturated with Instagram and Pinterest and there's images coming at you from everywhere. It's, it sometimes gets hard to have an original thought, like things mm -hmm. are, you know, so I really try and um, be influenced by things around me, but treat every single project as you as a unique starting point. Absolutely. And I find even too, like a lot of clients, they're influenced by certain things. And it's that fine line between copying it to get mm -hmm. them the look they're going for, but really just taking bits and pieces so that you're making it your own. How many clients come to you and say, I want this exact thing. Can you just mm -hmm. replicate this in this case? And you're like, what do you love about it? So that's yeah, one of the exactly. first questions that I'm working with clients because sometimes clients are really good at responding to an image or a material, or they come in and they say, I have to have this wall covering or this faucet. And we try and just get excited about it to their level, but use it as a jumping off point to yes. create something unique to that client or the space. And using it to build off of. Exactly. So let's go back yeah, for a minute because you've been in the industry for quite a long time and you have so much experience. Did you always want to be an interior designer? That's a really funny question. So when I was in school, I was going to be a lawyer or a geotechnical engineer. Nothing oh, to wow. do with design. I came from an academic family. I know, totally left field. But yeah. it's funny because some of the things that anyone who knows me and has worked with me or friends of mine, they'd be like, lawyer sense you know there is a lot of negotiating and sales and mm -hmm. understanding contracts understanding you know um code and analysis and and really you know complicated systems of buildings and environments mm -hmm. that are really applicable to the things that we do so I, I also always had this creative side but i never thought that i could make a create a career out of something as creative as we do and back then when I started, because it has been a number of years, <laughs> yeah. uh, I first started working in design. I was 19, right? So it's been wow. back then, interior, yeah, interior design is not what it is today. Like people right. didn't have right. the same kind of awareness, right? It was more of the decorator. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, even myself learning 
all the different facets and the things that I could do with design as I moved through my career, it's changed and evolved. And a lot of times the decorating part of it actually comes second because it needs to be functional and sort of to comply with all of those restrictions or yeah, building codes or requirements for the bill, the business or the client. And then you get to choose the finishes and do the fun stuff. You know, it's uh, the finishes and the look and feel and the concept is just a piece of the puzzle, as you know. And that's one of the main mm-hmm. differentiators too between residential and commercial is that you know, with each residence, you're typically working, you know, if you have a great opportunity to do a build from scratch, like build a new house or uh, completely fit out and gut an interior. Um, it's still right. fairly a, a similar thing from project to project, the same components. Whereas with commercial, mm-hmm. we're really challenged. Are we in a heritage building? Um, mm-hmm. Are we putting in the kind of use in that space that it's currently zoned for? Are we going to have right. to go in for a development permit? Do we require other consultants, mechanical, electrical, structural? What Mm -hmm. are the implications of the building space? So there's so much stuff that goes on in the background that a lot of clients aren't aware of and Mm -hmm. and things that we have to coordinate with other professionals to make. And so much ahead of time too. Like people don't necessarily realize how long it takes to pull one of these projects together. Years even, some of them. Well, and clients think, okay, I've decided I'm ready to go. Let's start picking finishes and ordering furniture and jump into it. And I'm like, you're, you're four to five months ahead of yourself. Yes. There's a lot of background work that we have to do to figure out, can we even put what your intended use is into this space? Mm-hmm. What are the code requirements? Who are the professionals that we need involved? Do we need mm-hmm. a permit? How far yeah. is the permit going to go? Do you have enough parking? Can you even put that type of use? Can you put an office in this industrial building? So there's quite a bit of process behind the scenes. Do you find um, that over the years that you've been in uh, design now, especially commercial, that there's been a lot of new products that are making the your life simpler, like as far as acoustics and that sort of thing? Because those are a lot of challenges in commercial spaces. They're typically big buildings, high ceilings, you know, very echoey or all of that, which have to be solved essentially. It has been so nice to see variety and selection. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, it's like, okay, we have acoustic problems in this space. We have to go to this cookie cutter solution. Whereas now, you know, you go to design shows and you see all the creative things that people are coming up with, with floating felt panels and Mm -hmm. different acoustic ceilings that are also decorative. So there's so many different products that inspire spaces for us as well that provide the function, but we can also build in the aesthetics right from the conceptual design phase. Even like in in office design and such, like now office furniture is extremely cool or like just so many different things that you can add into that space that and lighting that just like, I don't know, makes the look. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Lighting is a personal obsession. So some, some people <laughs> can <your> passion. Excellent. <laughs> right. some people can identify projects as ones that I've worked on through the lighting, which is kind of yes. funny. I never thought about it before, but um, lighting, particularly in a commercial environment is one of the most important things in a space. Mm-hmm. If a space is poorly lit, nothing's going to read. The finishes won't oh. read right? The quality of the colors. Well, like think back have. to the old fluorescent tubes. They actually give people headaches and stuff. And the being able to control the LED lighting and yes. the color rendering indexes and the temperature mm-hmm. of the lighting and have it change over the course of the day with the natural light that's coming in, having daylight rendering. There's so many advancements in technology with lighting alone. It's hard to keep up on. You know, I I can go to all the lighting things in the world and I feel like I'm always catching up on what the current lighting stuff is. So do you have a favorite type of project? I mean, you said you are passionate about lighting and that sort of thing, but like, is it restaurants or spas or is it just residential? Um, I think that restaurants are probably my favorite because they allow an opportunity to create a personality in a space. Right. Um, you know, sometimes we're doing something where the vibe needs to be really upbeat and happy or like a coffee concept or a cafe. We want right. people to come and hang out or are we trying to pump people through uh, mm-hmm. versus having a full restaurant concept where it's finer dining, where we want people to come in, have the lighting levels be lower, create right. more intimate spaces and allow pockets of privacy for people in a space that's still open in a restaurant. So. Um, I think restaurants are probably my favorite. 
Uh, but part of the beauty of working on commercial is that every project is so different. It allows yes. a completely different opportunity to flex your design muscles and your problem solving in such unique ways. So hard to pick a favorite. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about designing a Canada shop? I, yours is <laughs> so beautiful. Like it's so oh, high end. You. It could be a high end residential, or not, sorry, retail boutique. You know, uh, cannabis has been a really fun challenge. And uh, so some of my existing liquor store clients uh, that I do oh, a lot yeah. of work for, there's a natural partnership and transition from right. liquor regulations into cannabis regulations. And uh, so this project was for one of my existing clients that I do Cascadia liquor for and a number of their oh, other. Yeah. yeah, and a number Beautiful. of Beautiful. They really wanted to create a space that was different Mm -hmm. than what some of the other uh, local stores have been doing. And obviously with some of the regulations, it had gone from some of the illegal stores and the stores that had been selling in a retail environment that were mm -hmm. non-regulated into a very right. regulated situation. So a lot of education, you know, we, you know, together with the client, we had to learn a lot of stuff about what can we do? Where right. can we put these things? What are the right locations? What are the things unique to building out a cannabis location that we have to address with building out the space visibility into the store, mm -hmm. um, safety concerns, and what do we want that shopping experience to be like? So this one was kind of fun because we're like, who's shopping here, right? Because every yeah. cannabis store that you see has a very different flavor to it yes uh, right and some have been done really well in town you know mm -hmm. um, farm is a great example of a great design concept really high quality creating mm -hmm. a unique more accessible environment for people to shop yes. for because people are still trepidatious about the legalization of this industry right so when we were coming up with a concept for this we wanted to do something fun we wanted you know young people to come in and feel like it was hip and modern and cool and yeah. we wanted right and we wanted a sort of older demographic like my parents age to mm -hmm. also come in and feel equally welcome and comfortable yeah, not they have to pull the hoodie down yeah. and have your mask <laughs> yeah, on exactly. Hope the neighbors don't see me well and it's challenging to create both of those demographics inside of one space is, is quite challenging because they all have very different needs. And then you also have your consumers that are super familiar with the product. They want to get in and get out. They don't need help. They're, they know exactly right. what they're coming in for. And then you have other people that come in and they're like, I made it in the front door. Yeah, and now, now I feel what? really uncomfortable. Yeah, now where do I go? I feel yeah. a little bit stupid. I don't know what to do. Is there a personal shopper? Yeah. yeah, can someone assist me? So yes you know, when we were designing the space, we were trying to think through all those different people and how do we draw them into the space? And one of the designs of flight is we created this large central merchandising display in the center of the store with mm -hmm. curved ends. So it created a bit of a raceway. So oh, it maybe. drew you into the space and yeah. gave you an opportunity to float by things and sort of window shop a little bit through this. Almost space. like a high-end jewelry store or something. Exactly. Well, and the approach is actually very similar. I've worked on, you know, Hermes stores and Porsche stores and stores mm -hmm. where in that boutique experience, the product offering is very limited. So the displays are very curated. And right. cannabis is very similar because of the regulations. You have to have everything behind a lockable display. So mm -hmm. everything has to be in glass cabinets or glass displays. You can't have product out. So it's challenging to make the store feel exciting and like there's products right. for people to look at, but yeah. they can't access it. Mm -hmm. So it was very challenging. How, so say for your airport project, how did you make that exciting? Because airports are typically very mundane and kind of sterile, but you created this gorgeous space. Airports have been, uh, I've specialized in airport environments uh, my entire career, which a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know about me. And so I've worked on airport terminals, large scale airport projects from Surrey, and Bangkok through the oh, United wow. States. Yeah. So all over the world. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, there's been something really exciting about working. I love to travel. So yes experiencing airports and knowing what does and doesn't work, what I want to yeah. see out of those spaces when I'm captured in an airport for four or five hours before a flight or delayed flight. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> and you don't want to be there, but you're wanting to get you're to your destination, but you're there. <laughs> so entertain me and feed me, please. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
Uh, airports have changed a lot over the years that I've been working on them. And uh, good examples of that are LAX. Mm -hmm. um, it went from an airport that was just pumping people through and sort of retail and food and beverage and services were an afterthought in those environments right. to creating a hub, almost a destination. Like if yeah. people were choosing to go through one airport versus going through another, they're like, I want to go through LAX. I want that experience if I'm going to have a layover versus some other airports. Yeah. And you can see that some of their retail programs uh, and food and beverage programs are some of the best in the world. Working with chefs, uh, I've worked on Wolfgang Puck locations um, oh, wow. throughout a number of different airports and some of the highest end retail. And you know, LAX um, had a mandate in their airport design when they did the new terminals that it had to be over the top. So minimum right. spends, yeah, and, and <laughs> they're pretty impressive. Well, and I mean, how many people would they get through in a week even? Like astronomical hundreds hundreds numbers, thousands. hundreds yeah. of thousands. Yeah. yeah. So okay, this brings it to actually a viewer question. Yeah. Um, when you're designing for commercial design, you don't have just one client. You're essentially designing for the masses and trying to appeal and not offend anybody, I guess, or, or are you like, how, <laughs> how do you take any sort of criticism that comes your way or, you know, that sort of thing? You know, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about this earlier when you design as designers, yeah. I am so passionate about what I do and every creation that I do, it's like my baby and I'm putting it out there to the world, right? And it, exactly. it's terrifying in some ways because you're open to scrutiny and judgment or even the performance of the space. Did that material hold up? Didn't yes. it? Like the right. expectation, right? Yeah. Of the function of the space. But then the joy of it where people go through and they're like, oh, this is amazing. I can't believe yes. I've never been here. Or I want to go back there all the time because I enjoy the experience and the feeling in the mm -hmm. space, whether it be the tangible things or the intangible things. And yes. that is the reward, you know? And lots of times they don't even realize why they love it so mm -hmm. much. It's just that feeling when they walk into the space. And that kind of, I think, means that you nailed it. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Your business has changed a little bit over the last few years. You brought mm -hmm. an architect into the business as well. How has that changed things? So uh, Scott is the architect. So we're actually uh, life partners as well as business partners. <laughs> and working together. Yeah. And working together. Yay, COVID. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's really funny because we, um, we have been working together uh, with the combined business for about three years now. And COVID has added some interesting challenges. You know, in some ways, it's a day in the life for us because we have our beautiful studio in our home and we're used to working together and out of the studio in the house sort of day in, day out. Yes. Um, but having architecture back in the fold, I come from a background of working in boutique and large um, multidisciplinary firms. So architectural design firms or uh, like Stantec, large firms that have all the different disciplines, like disciplines that I, you know, um, archaeologists yeah. and scientists, right. and biologists and people that I would never need on my projects. But it's, it's so nice to be able to leverage that expertise in-house, yes. um, particularly architecture, because we go hand in hand. Oh, the crossover. I mean, yeah, hand in hand, essentially, they're yeah. in, entwined in each other. Exactly. Um, and for me... Um, having a one-stop shop for our clients and, and yes. Scott and I work on a lot of projects together, but we also mm -hmm. work on a lot of projects separately. So we're just able to give our clients the best offering on that mm -hmm. side of it and be able to handle as much or little of it as they want on their projects. And for TIs, um, tenant improvements, it's been very difficult over the years because municipality regulations have changed involvement of having registered professionals and having right. stamp drawings when they have to go into the city for permit has yeah. really changed it. You've probably experienced that as well. And being able to educate clients and, and mm -hmm. be able to carry that through um, a lot of the times before getting an architect to work with us or stamp drawings on a small tenant improvement project right. was really difficult. Yeah. Whereas Scott's involved from the beginning so he and then there's no holdups along the way exactly. either because he just makes sure that everything's ready to go. And 
it is so great having him involved because people also don't realize he's coordinating all the other consultants. He's talking yeah. to the city. He's talking to the inspectors. He's doing the due diligence before a project even starts to check right. the zoning of particular areas. Um, we'll go and do community engagement for projects, um, depending on the size, wow. um, to help support our clients. So mm -hmm. it's really nice to be able to offer that as a team in-house. That's so amazing. Yeah. We're almost out of time here, but I want to ask you something first before we go. Um, what would be your dream um, project? Like, what have you got going on in your head that you're just like, oh, I wonder when is that pet store going to come my way? Or, you know, something that's <laughs> percolating there that you just are so eager to do and it hasn't happened yet. That's a tough one because having been in this industry, I've been so fortunate to work on so many different kinds of projects yeah. and, you know, Opus Hotel in Vancouver. I mean, oh, I was yeah. really lucky to do that as an intermediate designer early on in my career. Amazing. Um, but I've always wanted to do a full um, destination resort that yes. had retail and hospitality, food and beverage. It had a nightclub. Yes. It kind of had everything together because yes. I also do graphics and I do branding oh. and signage and things as, as an aside. Yeah. Uh, so it's really nice to be able to fully immerse yourself in all of those different aspects. So I think that'd and be have the one you I have you come for full circle at all? Like, because commercial design needs to be refreshed every once in a while. Have you ever done a refresh on any of your projects yet? Absolutely. Um, we're actually going through some refresh right now. Uh, Bin 4, one of our local <laughs> favorite joints. Oh yeah, we yeah. all know Bin 4. <laughs> uh, when we did the first location uh, and developed the brand for the Yates Street location, uh, it was a very tiny space, very tiny kitchen. Uh, we were testing the concept. It was only ever meant to be a one-off. And mm -hmm. that was over 10 years ago. And we've built wow. seven locations since. Oh, they're um, doing so well. They're doing so great. Such an yeah. amazing client. They're like family. And we are just taking an opportunity now before we have some new locations, new exciting locations that are going to be coming up to revisit and do a refresh. And mm -hmm. Of course, every 10 years, you also cycle through materials. They start right. you know, discontinuing, so yeah. it's a good opportunity. Well, that's so amazing. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Where can our viewers and listeners find you? Uh, they can find us on our website uh, at inhabitdesigns.ca, and they can also find us on Instagram at inhabitdesignsinc. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much for watching Amy McGeechee's House Guests. Subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcast, and be notified when there's a new episode to listen to. We'll see you next week.